Hey, Trini, it's Ethan Campbell, the gardener's too. Can you hear me all right? Hey, I can see you. Okay, now you can you hear me? But I can't hear you. Let's see. Can, can you hear me now? Say, well, say something one more time. Can you hear me now? That's it. That was on my end. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, when it first came on, I wasn't showing in the video, so that's something might be wrong. Yep, I had to uh, promote you to a panelist, so we're all set. Okay. And you're going to be using um, the PowerPoint from your end, uh, running it on your computer? Yeah, I was going to ask, so I just bring it up, or how do I do this? Yeah, yeah. So uh, go ahead and uh, bring it up. Um, there should be a, a button that says Share Screen. It's a green button on the Zoom display. If you see that. Okay, hold on. Pull it up. I'm actually going to make you a co host. Okay. Share on screen. Share. Can you see it? Yep, there it is. I am just seeing the uh, sort of the slide. Um, right. If you click right. full screen, it should <clears throat> take it up. Perfect. Yeah. Looks great. And if you want to just change slides for me just to make sure it's transitioning okay. Great. Perfect. Looks good. I will be back in two minutes. Okay.
well. Hey Trini, it's Stephanie Foote. Hi Stephanie. Hey. You think can turn on our, you want to turn on the camera? We can say hello. <laughs> Properly. <laughs> We're in the webinar room. We haven't used this space probably since before the holiday. We've been in our conference room doing our webinars and virtual meetings. Oh, okay. Here we are. Hey. <laughs> Since we can see you, it's only right. Oh, Ethan. <laughs> he always turns the camera to me. <laughs> I don't need it on me. I'm very sleep deprived. So, how was the conference? Young, young baby. <laughs> Did you go to the conference? Oh. Stephanie, did you go to the conference? Can you hear me? Turning up. It looks like you're talking. I'm not sure. Yeah, I am. Um, oh, can you hear me like now? Muted, maybe. No, can you hear me now? Hmm? It did show up as. Let's see. Let's see what's going on. I'm just a second ago. Yeah, can you hear me now? Image again, his picture. Yeah. Nope, it looks like it's fine now. Can you hear me now? Can you hear us? I can hear you. Yeah, he says he can. Okay. Were you able to hear me? We just can't hear you. That's interesting. My mic. I took. I did a, a check. There we go. We got you now. We got you now. We're good now. Was, that, yeah. was it on your? Was it on your end? I think plugging. Yeah, I think plugging in the webcam freaked it out. Just threw everything off. <laughs> okay. How was the AHA conference? Oh, it was great. Yeah, it was fantastic. It was a uh, a whirlwind. You know, there's so, there's so much going on in such a short span of time. So it was it was really uh, fantastic. It was good to see the faculty that are involved in the project and to have a little bit more time with some of them to talk more deeply about the things that they're thinking about doing and and also the things that they're wrestling with so that was really good mm -hmm. okay looks like dan is on with us and he said thanks for the webinar so dan mcnerney thanks for joining us dan it's good to see you virtually i can't see dan am i supposed to see him or not no no just in the chat area oh okay although he certainly could be on camera later if you'd like to. <laughs> so we'll wait a few minutes and see who else joins us. Good night. I didn't realize this was gonna be one. Uh, give me one minute. Of course, yeah, take your time. We'll have some more people joining on, so we'll wait a few minutes. Okay, I'm back. Oops. Great. Uh, Trini, if you have a chance, take a look at the chat area. Okay. Dan mentioned uh, some more about the conference. I'm trying to see about it. Yeah. And it is 201, so we can uh, get started whenever you're ready. Yep. I'm trying to. 
pull up the chat area. <laughs> I've given him more tasks now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I'm trying to see how I pull that up. Uh, because I got my video and then I have uh, uh, the PowerPoint in front of me. Oh, well, that's okay. We can uh, take Okay, it. I found it. Okay, I found, I found out how to do it. Okay. Okay. Um, you want me to go ahead and start? Uh, yes. Why don't we go ahead and start? Um, hello, everyone. Okay. This is Stephanie Foote from the Gardner Institute. I'm joined today by my colleague, Ethan Campbell. Uh, we can turn on our video quickly, and then we're going to turn it right over to our webinar facilitator, uh, Dr. Trini Gonzalez. Uh, so welcome, everyone, to our History Gateways webinar. Uh, this is a fantastic and fascinating topic today, course redesign and the tricky work of questioning assumptions. And as I mentioned, our facilitator is Dr. Trinidad Gonzalez. So we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Trini. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, uh, joining me in the Garner Institute at, uh, for this webinar, uh, particularly for those people who are attending the AHA. I know that's going from uh, from that conference, which is uh, pretty packed, uh, to this webinar on Wednesday. Uh, so thank you for being here. Um, the title of the webinar is, as you see on the PowerPoint, Course Redesign and the Tricky Work of Questioning Assumptions. Now, I came to this webinar after viewing the previous two webinars and trying to figure out what would benefit participants of the grant and reflecting on how I've thought about course redesign and particularly thinking through my personal experience in higher uh, In Latino studies or Chicano studies, uh, we had this thing called testimonials. And testimonials is, you could uh, translate into uh, testimonials, uh, is a way of getting at our personal histories, our personal experiences, and then translating that into how we understand the world, and particularly furthering knowledge, right? And so what I'm going to do as we go through this webinar is ask you to do that, to reflect on your own lives. Uh, but before I begin with my story, uh, some just my introductory remarks about myself, I'll keep it brief. Uh, I am a history and Mexican American studies instructor at South Texas College. For those of you who are not familiar with the location of South Texas College, it is in McAllen, Texas. And if you've been following the national debates about immigration, uh, within the last year, McAllen has received a lot of attention, particularly when uh, Donald Trump arrived here. Uh, we're at the epicenter of the refugee crisis uh, on the U.S.-Mexican border. So if you look at a map of Texas, we're at the very southern tip. Uh, so this is, this is the institution I teach at. It's a border institution, predominantly uh, Latino, 90-some percent Mexican-American, but we have other Latino groups as well. Uh, previously, I was on the AHA uh, Council as part of the teaching division from 2014 to 2017. And while on the teaching division, uh, the John N. Gardner Institute reached out to the AHA to see if a representative would attend their, I guess, inaugural uh, Gateway to Completion uh, workshops, uh, which was when I went. I went in September, I was, me, I went in 2015, uh, and I was a representative of the AHA. Uh, and the reason they asked is they wanted disciplinary experts to be in conversation with those faculty that were teaching, in this case, history. Uh, and, and bringing our resources together. And so since then, the John N. Gardner Institute and the AHA have, have continued to grow that relationship to what we have today with this grant. Uh, because this is a concern, as the Gardner Institute has pointed out, the issue of uh, high failure rates or drop rates within the introductory history course. Also, while at the AHA, I helped begin the Texas Conference on Introductory History Courses. Uh, which continues today. Uh, this conference is uh, unique in that it brings policy uh, makers, in this case, the, higher, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board director and faculty who normally don't have any interaction with somebody like that uh, into conversation. Uh, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board will talk about the broader policy and political discussions concerning higher education. Uh, and then the conference also gets into the nitty gritty of how to teach in the classroom. 
And one of the things that we like to do is to point out that in order to develop policy, it should be driven by the faculty who are teaching in the classroom. In other, in other words, class practices should drive education policy, not education policy drive classroom practices, right? And so the conference in Texas has been doing that and, and having those conversations uh, uh, since 20, 2015. So it's kind of my background in the world of uh, history survey courses and history education, uh, broadly speaking. I've done some other things, but I want to keep this uh, brief because I want to get into my story and then hopefully use that as a catalyst for reflection uh, by the participants. Before we get into my story, um, I want you to reflect on your experiences in higher education. What was life like as an undergrad? What were some of the things that were challenging for you? What were some of the things that you found helped you overcome those challenges? And um, how do you think that experience has shaped your teaching? Uh, also, how has that experience shaped your views of what is expected from students in today's world? Right? And then uh, finally, and this is a question I started beginning uh, a conversation about on the gateways um, communities on the AHA is what does your experience or excuse me, how does your experience influence what you think is college level history, right? Uh, and we've had different, I think, uh, points of view to think about college level history versus high school history and what that entails. Um, I plan to uh, have a further post uh, probably next week. Uh, my wife wants a little vacation before we start school, so I'm gonna be doing that the rest of the week after today. Uh, but uh, next week, I plan to uh, further engage that conversation because I think it's an important conversation to have uh, because we have many assumptions and I don't think we've thought about thinking through those assumptions of what college level history is uh, or we've seriously reflected on our own experiences and how that might shape our teaching and then how maybe we need to question those assumptions uh, and rethink the classroom practices and what's expected of students and history education at the survey level. So this is going to be my story. And it's a story sometimes I share with my students as a way of getting them to understand I'm like them. Because I'm exactly like them, right? Uh, the students I teach. Uh, this may not be the case at the institutions you're teaching at, but this is, this is my story. I was a first generation college student back in the late 80s. Uh, entered college. My parents, neither of my parents went to college. They did graduate high school, but they had not attended college, right? My first semester in college, I received three D's and an F. Uh, this was the fall of 1988. I received the F in history, right? The three other D's I had an English, I think astronomy was the science class I was taking. And I think I had to take a, a, a remedial college algebra class or pre-algebra class before I could get into the college level algebra class that was required. So, you know, I get hit with this wall, three Ds and an F, right? Now, uh, I could not go to my parents to ask them, how do I deal with this, right? What is the solution with dealing with three Ds and an F? What is the solution with being put on academic probation? One more semester and I don't get it together, I get kicked out. So uh, I had some friends who had gone through this situation themselves, and so I was lucky in that sense. Uh, and they provided me a strategy of how to get out of academic probation. I didn't get the strategy from a counselor. I did not get the strategy from uh, faculty advisors. So I didn't have any institutional support of figuring how to deal with three Ds in and out. Uh, and the strategy was simple. It says, take a couple of kinesiology classes, i.e. PE classes, and then take one class you think you could do well on uh, the second semester. And so I, I took astronomy my second semester to, uh, as the, the academic course, right? Uh, and that did it. That got me out of academic probation, right? So the strategy was simple. Take <clears throat> uh, PE classes and uh, take a, a harder class and, you know, study. And that's what I did. So I was out of academic probation, uh, thankfully. 
and ended up with a 2.0 or something like that does the, at the end of the year. Uh, the following fall, a year later, after failing history, I took retook the history class with the same instructor. Uh, so this would have been the fall of uh, 1989. And he was a chalk and talk lecture, midterm final. Midterm 40% of your grade, final 60% of your grade. Uh, IDs, we write short answers, a couple of, uh, I think 20 multiple choice questions, and a long essay question. And it was in class, blue book, Scantron uh, is the way we took the test. And that was it. Uh, I made a D on the midterm. So I said, you know what, I need to go ask the instructor how to improve, particularly my long essay. It was the long essay was, I think, 60 or 70 percent of the, the final grade for the, the exam. And uh, so, again, this is the 1980s, right? This is the early 90s. His response, write more, write better. What do you mean by write more, write better? Says, well, you just need to improve your writing. Well, how do I improve my writing? Well, go figure it out. Uh, and so I kind of fell back on the five paragraph essay training I had received in high school. I didn't have the sort of high stakes examination uh, structures we have today. Uh, and it was required back then you had to write a research paper in order to graduate high school in Texas. So I fell back on that as some sort of solution on how to write better. Uh, to say the least, obviously the instructor was not really helpful. I eked out a C in the class. Uh, I was able to pass my final, I believe with the low 80, and that got me to a C for my final grade. Um, and that was my experience with history. Uh, I was later told by another history faculty member who would be my future mentor, uh, that the history survey in the 80s and 90s was a washout class. And what he meant by that was history was specifically meant to weed out what they considered weak students. And by weeding out weak students meant offering no help to those students at all. Uh, and reducing then the class that came in as freshmen to sophomores. And they saw that as then being rigorous and ensuring that quote, only quality students continued on through the pipeline in higher education. Uh, so I almost got washed out, I guess you could say. Uh, and we still see this today, obviously. And this is why we have the grant. History has a significant number of students who if they fail the class are not gonna continue on. Uh, and so I then uh, went on to work on my master's at this institution, which was the University of Texas Pan American. The faculty member who had told me uh, about this idea of the survey class being a washout class became, uh, as I noted, my mentor, and I became his TA. He was still a chalk and talk uh, professor, but he did set aside uh, one or two class sessions on how to teach the basic structure of writing for his exam essays. Uh, straightforward five paragraph exam essays. He provided uh, on an overhead projector, an example of an A paper and an overhead projector, I mean, uh, excuse me, an example in an F, F paper. And he asked the students to think about uh, what was wrong with the F paper, right? What are the issues you saw there, right? And so for him, uh, again, these are blue books, uh, five points were all taken off for uh, fragment sentences three points for grammatical errors, two points for any misspellings. Uh, so you had a whole section just with uh, the structure writing that weighed heavily on the final uh, grade for the exam essay. Both these instructors are gonna help shape my understanding of how to teach uh, as I move forward through my career in teaching. Uh, I'm going to have the idea or be shaped by the idea, whether I accept it or not, of history being a rigorous course. What rigorous course meant to me was that I will have high failure rates or drop rates. Uh, but it, I was also shaped with the idea that I should teach students how to write. Okay. What uh, ways uh, could I help them uh, improve on their writing? Because I've seen issues of writing obviously occur. 
Um, now I know that issues of writing have always been a standard issue for higher education as long as higher education has been around. Uh, so I, I, I take both of their ideas and I implement them uh, in the teaching and how I'm shaped as a teacher. Uh, I don't teach this way anymore. I've fundamentally rejected both of those instructors' uh, influences on how I teach. One, i not against the lecture, but I understand that the lecture cannot be the whole of the course. Uh, also, uh, the high stakes nature of examinations or assessments, I've completely rejected. So I'm a different person, uh, well, I guess 30 years later uh, than I was when I was an undergrad. But that power of that experience uh, that I had as an undergrad shaped me. I still see the 1980s and 1990s mentality when it comes to the idea of rigor in college level work and how we should then uh, treat or help or not help our students. Uh, the expectations we have of our students as they come in. Um, uh, while I was in the AHA, I went to the college board when they were redesigning, had redesigned their assessments on the AP. Uh, and their argument for rigor was a high 50% failure rate on their AP exams. And I explained to them that's very 1980s. Uh, we don't look at education this way anymore. Uh, where significant numbers of people failing means you're a tough or a good instructor. So this is my story. Uh, I'm assuming that everyone has the same story I have. But what I think is important as we continue on this process is to really reflect on how maybe our experiences might inhibit how we can think about education, particularly education for the history survey. What are some assumptions we have about what college should be like? What are some assumptions we have that the students should be like and be able to do? And how are those assumptions interfering with our ability to either accept new ideas or to create new ideas on how we approach history education? So uh, I would like uh, if you're comfortable for people to share their experience in higher education and how maybe that experience has uh, shaped um, your expectations. Right? So at this point, I'd like to take a, a few minutes to maybe hear from the audience, uh, one or two or three members, what their, their experience as undergrads uh, was like and how they think that might affect have affected uh, their teaching. And so I'll, I'll give a second or two um, for anybody to either write something on the chat or to chime in. Can people chime in, Stephanie? Yes, they sure can. We would be happy if you'll raise your hand, participants. We can unmute your microphone so you can chime in. Okay. It looks like we have someone right now. Jillian, Hi. you should have the ability to talk now. Hi there. Thank you so much for organizing this webinar. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, so I'm Canadian and I had a really different experience for my BA in my history classes. There was a lot of, um, there would be a combination, luckily, of essays and um, exams. And so, uh, but I do overall remember having to memorize a bunch of information and then reproduce that on exams. And then when I got to be an MA student um, at Georgetown in Washington, I was a TA and I found it much more productive because there was the one hour discussion sessions for um, getting people to ask questions of the sources and things. So I found, I noticed an improvement, whether it was from the countries or it was just a matter of change over time. I did find that Socratic method that, um, that you mentioned your um, mentor used uh, to be more fruitful as a means of getting students to engage the material. Thank you for sharing. 
um, um, how do you think, or how long have you been teaching? How do you think those experiences might have uh, shaped how you teach? Well, I've been teaching for about 10 years now, okay. and um, I do try to ask, get students to ask questions. I've been disappointed in terms of, um, and so I feel like I need to make some adjustments in terms of my expectations for reading, like the students. I, one of the reasons I'm interested in redesigning the curriculum is I just am not managing, I, I keep making, assigning less and less reading and now I'm finding myself cutting, like providing the questions because students aren't generating enough questions at the lower level courses, like first, second, even third year courses. So it's only in the fourth year courses where I find they seem comfortable coming up with questions. Dan, did you have a, did you want to chime in? Yeah, uh, uh, Trini, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Now. Oh, great. Uh, Trini, thanks very much. Stephanie and Evan, thanks so much for this, uh, for this webinar. I want to join You're Julie welcome. Uh, in expressing my, my gratitude for this. Uh, a very short story. Um, unlike Trini, um, I mean, I had a, a privileged background in higher education with uh, half of the family having uh, post-secondary experience guiding uh, the whole the whole issue about choosing a college, moving through it. Um, but when I started teaching, and that was in 1984, I, I was guided by some suggestions that colleagues gave me, and they're quite similar to the suggestions that Trini received from his uh, first professors. The, the guidance that I was that I followed from colleagues. Lose your losers. Uh, I, I'm, I'm actually quite embarrassed to, to make reference to that today because uh, following what Trini and Stephanie have suggested, the whole, the whole issue about this lose your losers conception of teaching meant that their failure was somehow a sign of my success. Um, which also meant the opportunities that opened for me would be closed to them. Wow. Uh, it's, it, it, it leaves me very uncomfortable today reflecting back on those initial years in teaching. Uh, what, what changed things for me, and uh, I know uh, Trini and many other colleagues in the American Historical Association share this, uh, was the development in the AHA of the tuning project back in 2012, which focused on a very simple question, a simple but complex question. When students complete a major, what should they know, understand, and be able to do? Mm -hmm. Like the Gateways Project, it was an initiative which basically called for conversations among faculty members. And the conversation then and now was in, in, in a sense, what are we trying to achieve in our courses? What are the disciplinary ideals we, we share? And how do we best communicate those within our classes to our students? Mm -hmm. um, this whole notion of, uh, I think one of the key ideas that have come out of it has come out of these projects from tuning uh, through uh, uh, many other initiatives in the AHA is this simple con, simple, a complex idea. How do we make the implicit explicit mm -hmm. to our students uh, and sh share what we just take for granted about academic culture and uh, inform our students about the nature of our work and our environment. Um, everything from explaining to them what gen ed is all about to explaining a very simple idea that office hours are not the time that we don't want to be disturbed by students. They're the time we want students to come to our offices. All these work uh, projects have taught me quite a bit uh, in my, now that I'm a 
technically a retired professor about ways of continually experimenting with my courses. I see there's a comment from Amy Powers as well, uh, noting uh, that uh, uh, she was taught that uh, the course is a weed out course as well. So I, it's interesting because I always thought that was unique to me as far as being told that. <laughs> I wonder how, how widespread that is utilized across the discipline in higher education. Uh, I believe there's two other participants that have their hands up. Uh, if you want to jump in, please feel free to, please feel free to jump in. I'm hearing somebody in the background. I think that might be some background noise. It looks like we've gotten to the participants who had their hands raised. Okay. Well, uh, uh, let me this out. Let's go to the next slide. <laughs> this is just, this was really, uh, and, and when I thought of this session, I should note that I really wanted it to be a conversation and really get into the idea of reflection, uh, reflection about ourselves. We tend to talk a lot about what's going on with the students, but we tend not to talk about ourselves, uh, uh, I think. And that's very important when we come to thinking about what we're trying to do. So I came up with some generic definitions of gatekeeping versus teaching. Uh, so these are mine um, uh, as I put them together in my ideas. Uh, Julian, you had a question? Was I uh, No, no, we were just lowering, oh. lowering the oh. hand. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, so, you know, I hate reading PowerPoints, but I'm just going to read it <laughs> in this case. Uh, gatekeeping, uh, the process of creating assessments with little or no instruction toward helping students pass such assessments. Uh, teaching consists of providing content with little or no instruction related to skills. Assumption is that students should already have needed skills to be college ready when they enter the classroom. Uh, and this is, I keep it this very short. Uh, I assume we're going to have other webinars where we start talking about reading like an historian is very distinctly different than reading uh, the way other disciplines read. Uh, there's certain structures that we utilize that we explain to students would help them really understand what's being read. And one of the first misconceptions is that the textbook is not a factual account of the past, that it is an interpretive account. Uh, so there's all sorts of things that just go on with uh, how many of us actually get students to understand that uh, there's a way to read history and that history is this argumentative discipline that engages in, in interpretation of the past that's not simply a laying out of facts, right? You know, I, when I first started teaching, I didn't do that. I didn't even think I needed to do that. I don't even think I understood I knew how to do that as an instructor. It was already something that was part of my expertise of going through graduate school, right? Uh, so when you look at gatekeeping, it's really about, I'm gonna get up there, give them the content, and they gotta memorize it and regurgitate it in some sort of analytical sense on the assessments I give them. And I'm not really worried about success because it's really, in this case, it's the content is my responsibility. And then my professional development is about learning about the new research out there. So I read new books or go to conferences and then incorporate those into my lecture notes. And uh, they got new material and I'm doing my job as an instructor. Uh, so that's why I look at gatekeeping when it comes to history instruction at the survey level. Teaching, on the other hand, is the process of assessing students' various, uh, various knowledge and skill levels and developing assignments to help them successfully pass assessments and learn. No, I also should note, passing the class is not the same as learning, right? So we can engage in all sorts of techniques to increase our passing rates. That is not the same thing as learning, right? And I, and I assume that's going to be another conversation and, and another uh, webinar or some other setting where we talk about uh, learning versus passing, right? This is all this psychology out there, educational psychology that looks at learning and pass right. You can have short-term memory and pass the exam, and then you forget about it in the next couple of weeks, and you really didn't learn anything. Uh, this is what academically adrift is about. This is what uh, other individuals who look at higher education uh, learning and its failure to move the needle on real what they consider real learning, right? As opposed to short-term memory work that gets them to pass an assessment. So these are 
in a nutshell, my reflections on gatekeeping and teaching. It took probably a decade or maybe less or maybe more than a decade. I can't really, I, I should have kept a journal, I guess, as, as teaching. But uh, I did not begin teaching uh, as the idea of teaching. I began teaching as a way of gatekeeping with the caveat of uh, set aside a class or two to help students write, uh, to teach them how to write their exams. But I never did any follow-up work to see if it stuck. I never did any follow-up work in any way to help understand how to read, et cetera. Uh, that's, uh, it's taken me a, a long process. I taught my first higher education class in 99 as a TA. Uh, so I've been doing this for a while. Not the same way as back then. Now, this is kind of, I think, very important conversation and, and something I think we have difficulty discussing as educators. Um, as the anxiety associated with reflection. Uh, because if all you've experienced is, this is what history is supposed to be. If all your experiences uh, at conferences, this idea of what we'd call in the HA when I started, when I was there at the two-year task force, uh, issues of elitism, right? Uh, if all we're dealing with is the idea of who is better than somebody else, it's hard to then to engage in conversations about, well, maybe we need to start worrying about who's better than somebody else uh, and what skills or skills they don't have or where, where they come from and start thinking about how all of that uh, experiences, whether in conferences or in my graduate training or my undergraduate training, how has that uh, affected me? It's hard to reject the cultural world you come from. And what we're talking about, and this is where the anxiety comes from, is that we're talking about fundamentally changing the cultural world, cultural capital, if we want to get it, you know, use an academic phrase, uh, that we uh, engage in, right? And so a natural response I've seen when I brought these issues up in my own department uh, to how do we help increase uh, academic success and learning and I, again, those are two distinct things I think of. I don't think of them as the same. Uh, a natural response I get from them is, well, we're lowering our st expectation standards because students aren't prepared, right? And then they get into, well, I feel bad for students, but it's the K-12 educational systems part, right? Or it's their parents' part. Or I really, really, you know, feel for these students. It's their socioeconomic, cultural, as a cultural, political system, inequality in our society. Uh, that is a structural force I cannot you know, individually change. And so, you know, I'm got to choose between lowering my expectation standards or passing students, right? Uh, I think creating those argument the dilemmas as a way to avoid uh, course redesign and a way to avoid really reflecting on what it means to be a teacher versus a gatekeeper. Uh, and all these responses are signs of anxiety related to being questioned about what you're doing. And that's fine. It's okay to feel this anxiety and it's okay to, to go through this natural response. What I do not think is okay is to stay stuck uh, with that sort of response and uh, sort of lament the world and they go on doing what you're doing because the reality is we are affecting hundreds and hundreds of lives out there. Uh, you know, somebody asked me, what is, what is an educator? Uh, and we are entrepreneurs of the human spirit. You know, if we're not engaging and people engaged in what is self-realization or whatever it is, uh, I think we're failing, right? Uh, and that forces us to, to think about uh, the, all these things, particularly to think about maybe I've been doing it wrong the last 10 or 15 years or five years, whatever it is you've been teaching. And to say, maybe I'm at the center of what needs to be changed. Um, other anxiety that's associated with all of this. Uh, and we're getting this from the, the advances in how we understand students learn. Uh, uh, so the Society of Teaching and Learning in History is, I think, a very important development since the 90s till today that unfortunately is not as well, I think, received or as widely received as it should be. Uh, but decentering the lecture and embracing other teaching methods, right? Uh, I, I went through the system with uh, chalk and talk. I taught chalk and talk. Probably for over a decade. I still use lectures, right? But I have mixed it up, right? Uh, 
And one, and um, these are my anxieties that I went through, right? One of the first things that uh, when I first engaged in after learning activities in the classroom was a sense that I was not teaching, right? That um, I'm getting paid for being lazy because I'm not lecturing, right? Because to me, my paycheck was based on my ability to lecture uh, interest, uh, with an interesting way of lecturing and with uh, the latest information out there that the students should receive. Right? And if I wasn't doing that lecturing, then I wasn't, I was somehow cheating the taxpayers. Uh, there's also a sense of loss of control, right? You're no longer the ego in the center of the room when you engage in some of these other teaching methods, right? And that creates anxiety. And I still go through this anxiety. And I had uh, uh, conversations uh, at the Texas History Conference one year with, uh, with uh, uh, Kendall about this, right? And, and we still go through this, even those of us who embrace these ideas. We still go through these sorts of uh, anxieties. Of, am I doing something that's working or not working? And the reality is sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, and then there's spatial dynamics uh, 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 changes uh, that you got to deal with uh, in the classroom, right? Are you in a 400 person lecture hall or are you in a smaller room with 23 people, right? Uh, if you're going to engage in some of these new teaching methods, are you simply going to say, well, it's a lecture hall, I can't do anything about it? There's was a really good video by Ann Hyde where she faced that issue and she came up with some solutions to deal with avoiding the chalky talk as a way to deal with that. But again, this creates anxiety because this is the way we were taught. And then anytime you engage in sort of new methods of teaching, you have to deal with uh, student frustrations because the new methods you might be utilizing for them to teach are methods that they themselves are gonna find frustrating. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, it's really being explicit at the beginning about what's going on and their frustration. And I literally have a, a set message to my students. Is it's okay to feel frustrated. You're normal, all of you are normal, right? You're gonna have problems as you're going through this learning process, but you're, you'll, you'll get it at the end, of, you'll get it as you progress forward. Uh, and academic success can be elusive, right? Uh, I've changed my courses several times. I tried different things uh, to increase my academic success. Some have been successful over time and then they're not. Some started out not so well, stuck with them, they got kind of better. Uh, this is something we're constantly going to be striving for. Right? The, the neat thing about Chalk and Talk is it's been done for hundreds of years. And you can say it's been done for hundreds of years and you can continue to do it because that's the way it's been done, right? This is what higher education is. Um, and that's comforting. Uh, trying new things and to have the doubt that you might not be good at initiating these new ways of teaching and learning uh, creates anxiety, right? So one of the reasons I want to have this, this webinar was just reflecting on my own anxieties that I went through. And one, accepting that I've been wrong uh, and some of the ways I try to teach. And then two, uh, the associated anxiety of what I thought was expected of me uh, in the classroom and then trying these new methods that sometimes work and don't work. Because again, we do have other people's lives on the line. And so, uh, I, I just want to say this is okay, right, to, to go through all these uh, uh, levels of psychological development as an educator is reflect on your own lives and experiences, as well as uh, from a student to uh, uh, your teaching. Uh, and so one, I think the main points uh, for the Gateway Project uh, as a collective uh, is that you're not alone, right? Uh, we're all doing this, we're all going through the same issues. We're all still thinking about this. Uh, and it, it's, it is hard work, right? It is very hard work. Uh, so at this point, questions and venting are allowed because this also should be a venting session, uh, I think, uh, about all of this as well. And venting is good. Because then when you get through the venting, you can, you can get to the questions and you can get to the questions you can start thinking about what you are trying to do in the classroom. And uh, as Dan talked about, you're gonna have colleagues uh, that support and don't support you. You just got to keep moving forward uh, with what you're trying to do and, and surround yourself as much as possible, either within your department or outside your department, with people who are like-minded in the effort you're trying to engage in and helping the students succeed and learn. So with that, uh, I would like to open it again for questions and or comments. Looks like Chris. Uh, Chilos is raised his hand. Chris, you should have an opportunity now to speak if you'd like to. Yeah, 
Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, here we go. Thanks. It's been very uh, useful and interesting, and it builds well on the various AHA panels I attended in New York. Um, something that you you sort of address, and most of the panels at least alluded to, but at least the panels and sessions I went to and, and in your presentation, I don't know if I feel we've addressed adequately sort of an elephant in the room. And that is, you know, when I started 25 years ago, I didn't start in the US, I started abroad. So it was a very different situation. But when I came back to the States, um, even since then, which is about 15 years, um, the rise of mental health challenges among our, um, you know, freshmen students, not only freshmen, but especially that, you know, as they're moving away from their home environment and their local communities and coming into the university. Um, and I feel in, in our work with our especially steering committee here at my university, I feel that we need to somehow include that piece more directly. Um, and it's going to look differently at each institution, but there'll be a lot of similarities. And I just wanted to know your thoughts on that or anyone else's thoughts, mm -hmm. uh, because we aren't trained in many ways to teach, right? But we certainly, probably very few of us have been trained on the support services, identifying then what to do. We have uh, structures and we have software we've started to figure out very well at our university how to handle that. But the reality is we may not always identify these problems unless the student suddenly starts to be mm -hmm. absent. And that usually sets off triggers. So I'm just curious, what are other people's experiences with that mental health challenge? And in interestingly enough, as I was waiting to return from New York at LaGuardia, I was looking at the New York Times and there was a new report that was being, uh, you know, a study that was being reported about this, you know, incredible rise in suicide in the last 10 years mm -hmm. among teenagers connected to, of course, mental health problems, especially among women. And since women are now the larger gender population at the university, to me, it's even more important to talk about mental mm -hmm. health. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your, for your comments, Chris. Um, my second year teaching at South Texas College, one of my students committed suicide. Uh, committed suicide after the semester was over. And the only reason I knew about it is because his father came and uh, <clears throat> asked for his work. So, ah, sorry. But uh, what I've done since is work very well with my counseling services uh, and trying to be able to identify signs of mental health. And uh, I can report the student uh, to, as a reference to the counselor so that they can reach out to the student, but also give the students the information and also have walk students to the counseling services before. Uh, so yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's a, an important uh, aspect of educators that we have to deal with, right? Because um, we're not just simply teaching history and the skill sets and the minds of, of, of history. But like I said, you know, we're entrepreneurs of human spirit. So we're also dealing with the whole of the human and, and we should be available for their support. Now, obviously institutional very varies or the institutional varies from what kind of counseling services they provide. Uh, also I have a lot of students with PTSD uh, because we have a heavy uh, veteran population at, at our campus as well. Uh, but I think being sensitive to that and then thinking, it, this is one of the things that also, you know, I, I think I'm lucky in that I would allow students to turn in work that people would consider late or even give incompletes and work with them to complete the class in the spring. Mm -hmm. uh, blackboard shells, right? So there's other ways of saying, you know, instead of like you sink or swim in the semester and my, my hands are washed of you at the end of the semester is to think through uh, how we can work with the students who may need more time or support to be successful. That, those are, I, 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 I look forward to hearing what other people's experiences or ideas are as well with mental health. Looks like Dan has uh, raised his hand. Yeah, 
I'm especially appreciative of the comments that Trini and Chris have made, because I, I think it, uh, I, I'd like others on this webinar to think about a larger context for the Gateways project. Mm -hmm. The more I hear about this project and talk with colleagues engaged in it, the more I'm convinced of uh, the essential role we're playing, not simply in historical research and historical teaching, but in addition, the role we take on in academics in dealing with a society that sees so many social safety nets failing. I think we, we all know about this in talking with our colleagues and seeing what happens on our own campuses. Students who are going through problems of finding food, shelter, harassment, uh, Chris's very important reminders about mental health issues, the needs of veterans, older students returning to the classroom. Just talk to any librarian to, to understand the changing, the changing services that libraries are providing for communities to step in where the larger society is failing and where the apparent prosperity of our, of our nation is actually not reaching all that many people. Um, I, I, I hope that when we, we engage in, in this project, we're taking very seriously the shifting roles of faculty in terms of equity and social justice mm -hmm. and understanding how much these, these positions, these goals are, are part of our work in the 21st century now, for, for better or worse, mm -hmm. but it is the reality of, of uh, for most of us on most of our campuses, maybe not the top elite institutions, uh, but we're the ones teaching, you know, 95% of American students um, and uh, especially students who are facing these crises in their lives. This is, it, it, it gives another, it gives another twist to the idea of student success, not just getting a passing grade in the course, not just receiving enough Carnegie credit hours, it's success understood far more broadly in opening doors for students for whom by no fault of their own doors have closed and allowing them to enjoy the opportunities that we've had. Well, as someone who teaches student development theory every single semester, I can't tell you how delighted I am to hear the conversation going in this particular way because it is such an important part of the work that we do uh, to really consider the, the human, the whole human that we're educating or attempting to educate. Uh, Trini, I noticed you mentioned uh, to Jillian that this, this is the kind of question and conversation that would be great for our discussions on the AHA communities page and I hope that we'll um, that we will do that, that we'll have this conversation because it's something that we do need to be talking about and, and thinking about as faculty um, involved in this work and, and having conversations about what we might do um, and ideas, sharing ideas of how we respond to students. Looks like there was a comment from Jillian. I'm not sure how to balance flexibility on deadlines with the need to prepare students for the right. job market where bosses may not be so flexible. Um, that, that's an interesting question, right? So like when I looked at my role as a scholar for publications, uh, you know, and, my employment at STC, do, does my employer take into account issues of family leave? Does my employer take into account uh, personal leave? Does my employer take in, how does my employer treat me, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I took those ways I'm treated and then the ways I would like to be treated uh, by my employer and I incorporate those principles into my classroom, right? And so when I did that, particularly when it comes to intellectual work, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how many people have had deadlines for writing projects that have missed their deadlines? But as an editor of the project, you're going to have to deal with that, right? right. And if you're editing a book, it's hurting cats. Uh, and uh, you don't, you know, usually have to accommodate 
that contributor's piece to your edited work, uh, which might push you back right on your own deadlines. But so we make accommodations to each other as colleagues all the time. Uh, I think one of the things we should, uh, uh, I would like for you to think about is how would we translate that as to making accommodations for our students when they need it mm -hmm. to their educational deadline. Now, again, not all bosses are going to be the same. And that is true. Uh, but there's also a learn, depending on what kind of institution you teach at, but you know, one of the biggest things that I have a challenge with with my students is getting them to understand the habits mm -hmm. And understanding you know, what it means to be a college student, period. Uh, you know, they're not even talking about thinking like a historian or the habits of history or, or any of that, but just to be what it, uh, doing what it takes to be successful as a historian. So I do talk a lot about my transition from a DDDF student to the Dean's List and, and, and what that took, right? Because I'm trying to use my personal history to get them to understand what they're going through, and I understand what they're going through, and then what they need to do to be successful. And it entails fundamentally changing how they live their lives, and that's always a hard thing to do. Uh, and, and and that means I have to be accommodative to those efforts, or is that, or I just lose them. So I, I it's not a simple answer, I guess. I might add, I think the other thing uh, to keep in mind potentially too is when we're talking about students, well, I think it is very important to hold them responsible. Um, I, I think from a developmental perspective, they're not quite where, uh, where many of us were when we were entering the job market. So there is that aspect of development that I want to honor and be aware of. So in terms of being flexible with deadlines, I find myself that you know, my students know that it has to be an extreme and documented situation. Um, and the documentation obviously can range based on what the circumstances are, but um, so it has to be an extreme case, but I, there is that opportunity to be flexible, knowing that later on when they are in the working world that they may be better able to cope with some of the things uh, that they're confronted with that are uh, significant and important in life. So we're working on developing that at, at the same time as, as also holding them responsible. May I add something or no? Absolutely. Yes, Chris, please do. I think that's a, I mean, this is a really great and, and challenging question. Um, I think so, depending on the size of your institution, the classes and what your disability resources services are like, mm -hmm. um, you might want to work with them, mm -hmm. even on individual students, but strategies in general. Uh, sometimes, um, I mean, if a student has documented disabilities, that, that's one matter. But if they don't, you know, they may have strategies. Also, you know, at what point do we then not give them what they need or challenge them to get to where they need to be? For example, group pro or project work is, is you know, very important for experience mm -hmm. for them to have. But if they decide without documentation that they just can't manage it, well, that can't be acceptable. Then we have to figure out how to work with them because they won't be able to go out in the world. Mm -hmm. have an ins I'm at an institution that does have a high number of students on the autism spectrum. And um, so we, we don't exactly recruit, but we're known for it. So they, their parents tend to come to our admissions days and so then there's another conversation that has to be had, and that is about career opportunities for mm -hmm. students. They're not just getting their degree, but then what do we do afterwards? How do we get them in? And, and you know, everyone can learn from that. The other students in the class that may not be on the spectrum or may not have any disabilities that they've declared. Um, and it does impact the classroom environment and teaching. Absolutely. Just a few thoughts. I, I, the way I come to deal with these questions, because, you know, I come from a military family, so getting to some place an hour ahead of time was the deadline before mm -hmm. you need to. Uh, I always come back, and this is what's helped me clarify then my course of action when it comes to a particular student or a class or groups of students is, am I engaging in a practice or a policy or utilizing a policy or behavior that is gatekeeping or am I getting a lesson across? So everything that to me has to be about getting them to understand a particular lesson across. That means it's going to be different for different students. It's going to be different for different classes depending on what's going on in the class. 
Uh, and then the reality is sometimes is no matter the things we try, students sometimes just don't do the work for various reasons, right? It, it's, it's, it's not, this is not easy work that we do. Uh, and it's, there is a lot of mental stress that we have as educators when we care about the students. We're just like, why don't they get it? Or why don't they do it? Or whatever, you know, or you feel bad. You know, I had one student that was homeless, uh, working. He was a dual enrollment student, so he was in high school working, getting about two or three hours of sleep. The other students, and they would eat lunch when they took my class. It was in the high school campus. And, uh, and uh, his friends would give him extra food so he could give to his mom or he could eat himself. Um, uh, he was just struggling. And so, you know, I worked with them as much as I could that semester, but also following semesters uh, because he didn't complete the class. They gave him an incomplete. And uh, it took a couple of semesters for him to complete the class. Uh, but I finally saw him, uh, and I think he's about to graduate or graduated already from college. Uh, and so that student, I always treated very differently than from other students. Um, uh, so it's, there's, there's no right answer here. This is teaching is a, a very much an art. Uh, and it's a, it's a hard sort of thing because we're, we're doing it with, we're doing this with real people. Any other questions or comments? Trini, do you have any last words for us? Um, you know, the main thing I wanted to, to, to uh, a couple of main things I want people to take away from the webinar is one is uh, uh, being self-reflective of your own personal histories when it comes to education. Uh, and then uh, reflecting on how that may have shaped or has shaped how you teach. And then thinking about how your teaching and how you've been shaped to teach that way and how the cultural world of our discipline and the world shapes us to teach that way. And maybe those things might inhibit it, be inhibiting us from being the kind of teachers we want to be uh, and the kind of world we want to live in, right? Uh, as Dan points out. Um, so those are the, my main thoughts. And then the other thing is it's okay to feel frustrated and angry and have anxiety and, and all of that because we, we do do hard work. So with that, I'll, I'll end my, my, my presentation unless there's another question. Oh, it looks like there is a, a question from Jillian. And this question is focused on ideas and suggestions on redesigning syllabi to get students to read critically and assignments mm -hmm. that don't involve crazy amounts of grading time, but are useful for students to learn history beyond memorization. Excellent yeah. questions. I, I, you know, I suggested earlier, one of the questions we could do is in the communities, but the other thing, uh, and I don't know who's deciding the webinar, but the other thing we could do is give us a, a webinar on the nuts and bolts of how to approach that, mm -hmm. uh, our approach those issues. So that's a very sort of, as I consider, because I come from a very tactical sort of uh, question and, and, and nuts and bolts of in the classroom stuff. And then, we might consider doing a charrette. Maybe we could do an online charrette or through some yes. sort of yeah. system where people come together on this particular topic, submit their work for review, and we each, each, each other give feedback. I'm not sure how many people have done charrettes before, but they're very helpful in fleshing out your assignments and, and the issues you're facing with your assignments or learning about new assignments that might be of interest for you to incorporate in your teaching. So uh, teaching charrette might be an online sort of environment, teaching charrette might be a great way to go about uh, dealing with some of these uh, class practices. Yeah, and Trini, you might recall when I first approached you about this webinar, I think I, I mentioned um, a topic of charrette, so we, we should revisit that, so teaching mm -hmm. charrette. Yeah. Um, in terms of the uh, your other specific questions, Jillian, um, you're, I don't think you're involved at an institution that's, that well, not one that's in our History Gateways project or in our our work that we do at the Gardner Institute, but we have a teaching and learning academy where we provide support to faculty that are involved in course redesign. And um, there are resources, webinars and, and online resources that we provide to help faculty think about what they might do with their syllabi. Um, and then also student evaluation. So rubrics are, are one idea that come to mind. I know sometimes they get a bad rap uh, because people think of rubrics in, in a very structured and formulaic, sometimes pedantic sort of uh, format. But um, 
there are other ways to approach rubrics that can help um, with the kinds of things that you've asked about. So those are all things that I can, I can direct you to if you're interested. So when I send out the recording of this webinar, you can let me know if you'd like to learn more and I can share with you some of those resources. I think our time is about up. I, I wanna go ahead and thank our wonderful facilitator, uh, Dr. Trini Gonzalez. Thank you so much. This has been very thoughtful and thought provoking. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I, th I thought it would be just the topic itself, but also the ways that in which you've engaged us in reflection today. I think don't begin and end today, but we'll continue on in the coming weeks and months. Um, it looks like Dan has made a recommendation for us to do an assignment workshop. Um, at the conference in 2020 in Seattle. Um, so I'll put that on the radar and we'll revisit that. The deadline I know it was coming up on February 15th for um, the call for proposals for the AHA meeting in um, January 2020. So we'll definitely get to that. There are some wonderful other uh, webinars that are coming up um, and I'll make sure that you have information about those when I send out the link to the recording from today's webinar. Thank you again to our facilitator and thank you all so much uh, for your recommendations. Oh, Seattle 2021. Yes, we're in 2020 right now. Thank you. <laughs> I'm still trying to commit 2020 to memory. So 2021. <laughs> Thank you all so much. And I look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. And I'll, I'll send out the recording shortly. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's see.